God of our fathers and mothers who have brought into our lives these wonderful, gifted young people. And they have so inspired us to want to reach out to you in a very special way. We pray that you will guide us as we reach out emotionally, spiritually, mentally to you in these remaining minutes that we have together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. They call me Dr. Williams. Some people even call me Double Doc, and so I am. And today, I'm going to prove to you that I'm a doctor. Because I'm going to do radical surgery. And of course, I have to confess, the surgery that I'm going to do is not medical, it is spiritual, for I don't want the cops to come in and take me out for pretending to be someone I'm not. But I think that the time has come for me if I continue to respond to the title Dr. Williams, the time has come for me to perform this kind of radical surgery. But you can relax because it's spiritual, not medical. And I will be performing it on the grandest of human beings called woman, despite the fact that she came from the hand of her creator, perfect in every single way. In fact, she was so majestic when the handsome hero whom God created first saw this stunning creature God had made from half of himself. I know you've been taught it was a rib, but in the original language, it was half of Adam that God took to make Eve. And so... When he saw this majestic creature that God had made, this stunning creature God had made from half of himself to rescue him from loneliness with great strength and support as an, and to, to serve with him as an equally powerful and influential companion. He exclaimed with delight according to Genesis 2.23. This, at last, is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called Isha. That's the original name God gave. We know it's been translated as woman. And he said he was delighted because... He said, she was taken out of ish, or man. You never know what you learn when you come to the grace place. So I'm throwing out some Hebrew words to pretend like I know Hebrew. Well, I barely passed it in the seminary, but enough to know what ish and isha means. So, although they were divinely permitted to name everything in the Garden of Eden, accept each other. They were not given permission to name each other. God said you can name the birds and the trees and everything, but they were not given permission to name each other. But as soon as their perfection was marred by sin, Ish, whom we know as Adam, usurped the role of God and renamed Isha Eve, which means to give life, or as some say, mother of life. 
You find that in Genesis 3, verse 20. He renamed her immediately after they were read the riot act by God for their rebellion to demonstrate the new rulership he would thereafter assume over Eve. Later, in human history, when Jesus, the Son of God, came in person to rescue humanity out of the clutches of sin, the female gender, or woman, became a biblical metaphor for the Christian church he established. In fact, she was so, the Christian church, the woman, was so divinely resplendent in Revelation 21, verse 2, she is described as a bride adorned for her husband, who is none other than Jesus, the second Adam. And she, as the second Eve, is, is described like a pleasing bride that had been prepared for her husband, adorned for her wedding. Wow. Don't, don't you kind of get an idea that she was a hot sister. <laughs> she was not just a normal sister. She was this woman, his church. Above all others, she was and still is the one and only apple of Jesus' eyes. So much so that the fallen angel, Satan... He became so jealous, he was filled with deranged intent to kill and destroy her. And since we are that church, the living body and bride of Christ, during this Women's History Month, my message is a radical call to cut off and cut out every single appendage of sin that Satan is using to kill and destroy Christ's beautiful bride. And because she was entrapped by Satan's wicked wiles, Jesus, Lord and Savior, came from the precincts of divinity to liberate the members of humanity from the power and penalty of sin. Therefore, to successfully accomplish this radical surgery, and I'm not doing it by myself, we're doing it together, let's follow his specific instructions in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 9, in which we find the process of partnering with Christ in this radical surgery to eliminate the persistent presence of sin. So please open your Bibles or your smart devices and turn to Matthew chapter 18 as I read from verses 1 through 9 and I am reading from the English Standard Version. Matthew chapter 18 verses 1 through 9. At that time and this was fresh from the Mount of Transfiguration and other miracles mentioned in chapter 17. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put the child in the midst of them and said, Truly, I say to you, Unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles him or herself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin it would be better for him or her to have a great millstone fastened around his or her neck and be drowned in the depth of the sea. And now verses 7 through 9, that was so beautifully read by our young people. 
Woe to the world for temptations to sin. For it is necessary that temptations come. But woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Note that Jesus began by unequivocally stating that his disciples then and now will need to be like a Pideon, a little or young child, in order to enter the kingdom of heaven and be great in it. He was describing childlike faith and humility instead of childish reliance on one's own goodness, skill, or achievements, and throwing tantrums when they fail to measure up to our expectations. He commended his disciples, those who believe in him and follow him faithfully, to be as a child. And while this isn't a derogatory remark or a subtle put down, he used the term child metaphorically to distinguish believers who are deficient in wisdom and understanding. The child also represents those not thought of as the big players in the kingdom, especially by the Pharisees and Sadducees, among whom his disciples' opinions were of little regard like those of a child. In his commentary, this writer, Craig Blumberg, sees the wording in verse 4, whoever humbles him or herself like a child. He sees it as a transition to show that little ones or children refers to disciples of little standing and not just children. As a matter of fact, he wrote, no one among those rich religious rulers then and now would contend for a child's respect, vote, or approval because to the powerful and, potentially mature, and pretentiously mature, children add no value or prestige to their concept of the kingdom of God over which they rule on earth, although not so in heaven. And to dramatically demonstrate these points, Jesus put a child in the midst as an example of innocence before temptations by the world comes to seduce them to sin against their creator. Frederick Dale Bruner, a renowned American biblical scholar, wrote that, it is not so much the child's subjective innocence or purity that is in view as it is the child's objective smallness and low status. The child, in the opinion of Jesus' culture, had to limit itself to listening and obeying. Get it? When Jesus says, you must become as a little child, he's talking about our ability to listen and obey. The child, in the opinion of Jesus' sculpture, I said that, and according to Jesus, it is not the significant one, the important one, the esteemed one who in the world is considered great, but it is the little one, the unimpressive one, the one standing in the background and in the shadow of the mighty ones who is the person Jesus considers great. Isn't that worth an amen? amen. 
Otherwise, we wouldn't be considered anything. Thus, wrote Bruner, from God's perspective, even the most inexperienced believers are little children. Praise God. In the parable of the lost sheep, which follows in verses 10 through 14, Matthew 18, 10 through 14, Jesus reveals the heart of God as one who seeks the humble or the humbled. Thus, in verses 1 through 6, he lays down the example of what he requires of his followers, which includes welcoming the unwelcome, loving the unlovable, and seeking after the stray or seemingly inconsequential sheep most would let go. God is pictured as a shepherd who isn't willing that a single one of his sheep would be lost. He loves the individual, even when it's a little one, most would cast aside. You see, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit diligently seek after their children who have strayed and do not abandon them to their own waywardness. I know that is fact because I'm here sharing this with you. Otherwise, where would I be? Dead or in prison? I remembered when I was first converted, I, was, I joined the Seventh-day Adventist Church in London, England. I was converted in America, but I moved quickly to England. And when I returned to the United States, my very first Sabbath, I was in a church. And there, up front, was one of the pe persons who helped me in my political campaign. I was running um, against my boss for the, for, for, for the position of mayor. And, and there, in the audience, was one of my team who used to see me smoking and drinking and drugging and doing promiscuous, all of these kinds of things. And I was shocked. I couldn't believe my eyes that he was also saved and a Seventh-day Adventist. I couldn't wait for him to finish leading song service. I, as soon as he came from the platform, I was up out of my seat, hanging on to him, asking him when, how, what happened, how, how come, how could this possibly be so awesome? He said, I was born and raised in this church. I was educated in all of the schools. So I wasn't brought in. And I said, why didn't you tell me about this message, about this beautiful Christ? Here I was thinking about committing suicide, having tried three times and failed. And you knew this? And you didn't tell me. He looked me straight in the face and said, the way you lived, your language, your behavior convinced me that you couldn't be saved. So I never shared a word with you. How dare us think that we are so in that we can determine who can be saved. You see, this parable has at least three primary themes. The parable of that follows those words in verses 1 through 6. It has the metaphor of sheep that points out the unruliness of believers we're like sheep. You know, sheep, they're not calm and nice little creatures. They're obnoxious and unruly. And God seeks out any and all lost children who are his sheep. 
And God sees his children as little ones who are sometimes both obnoxious and obedient, who are tempted by the world to sin. However, it's to Jesus' comments that took a sudden caustic turn in verse 7, to which I now point your attention. There, he announced emphatically, Woe to the world for temptations to sin. His emphasis on woe is one of the familiar words Old Testament prophets often used when referring to grief, anguish, affliction, wretchedness, calamity, or trouble. It is sometimes used, as in this case, as an exclamation of judgment on others. For example... Woe to those who enact evil statutes and to those who constantly record unjust decisions so as to deprive the needy of justice and rob the poor of my people of their rights so that widows may be their spoil and that they may plunder the orphans, declared the Lord in Isaiah 10 verses 1 and 2. Woe! On the world for temptations to sin, declared the prophet, priest, and king, Jesus. He spoke strongly against the stumbling blocks the world puts in the way of believers to trip them up to step down into the lake of eternal fire. Later on, Jesus used the word woe seven times in Matthew chapter 23, indicating the completeness of his condemnation and judgments against those who tempt his children to sin. For the number seven in their culture is one of completion or perfection and shows that God's judgment will be complete and perfectly just. Then Jesus adds, for it is necessary that temptations come. But woe to the one by whom the temptation comes, in verse 7. This he said to indicate that temptations are indispensable. However, he does not say or mean that God is directly causing his children to experience temptation to sin in order to be saved. For sometimes the suffering person brings about their own woeful condition as a natural result of foolish choices. He is, however, saying that temptation to sin is part of living in a world full of sin where facing temptation is unavoidable. However, those who lead them into sin will face God's painful wrath in the judgment, and it won't be like a walk in the park. To the world and those in it who tempt his bride, the woman, the church, and their little children to sin, Jesus said these harsh, provocative, and confrontational words. Let me say them again. Woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. Ah, shudder, shudder, shudder. This is a terse warning of the wrath of God in the judgment for anyone who would dare to cause one of his little children to fall into sin. There are two other things Jesus is not saying in verse 7 to which I want to point your attention. He's not saying it is necessary for Christians to give in to temptation. Temptation to sin may be a fact of life for believers, but giving in to it is always avoidable according to 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. There this is written, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to humanity. 
God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Notice he didn't say that he will not let you be tempted, but he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape. And sometimes he steps into the temptation with us. That you may be able to endure it. The second thing Jesus is not saying is that believers who sin, who stumble, are permanently lost. They can get up, cling to the cross, and continue to follow him as forgiven and accepted saints. This is why I focus or attention at the grace place on our houseless friends, some of whom sometimes sleep on the cold concrete at our front door. This is the reason I focus our attention on them because I want them to see me as an example of what Christ can do. You see, there's a lot of Christians who were born and raised in Christianity and they're nice and wonderful people and praise God for them. But they're not the only people God is out to save. God is out to save people like me. A drug addict. A promiscuous person. A tobacco smoking three packs of cigarettes a day person and if he can do that for me imagine what he can do for you and not only did he save me and call me his child but then he sent me to school to get education so that I can read his word and understand it so that I can tell my brothers and sisters who are where I used to be that it's only one decision, one decision. Say yes to Christ and you're on a road to everlasting glory. You see, what Jesus is underscoring is the reclaiming of our divine freedom from guilt and any pressure to impress others so that when we walk through valleys where temptations lurk, we will live out our high calling as children of God. This means we will not be bothered or upset by negative personal or people opinions or actions. Note that I stressed the words opinions and actions. I did so to emphasize the difference between biblical commands of God, which are to be upheld by everyone, especially those in Christ, as opposed to human opinions and actions established by culture or custom. The best way to operate was established by Jesus Christ in Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12, where this is written. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, whatever they tell you, do not do whatever they tell you, do and comply with it all. But do not do as they do. For they say things and do not do them. And they tie up heavy burdens and lay them on people's shoulders. But they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a little finger. Seems like the writer of this visited North America. Christian churches. And Jesus asked. And they do all their deeds to be noticed by other people. For they broaden their phylacteries 
and lengthened the tassels of their garments, and they loved the place of honor at banquets, and the seats of honor in the synagogues, and personal greetings in the marketplaces, and being called rabbi by the people. But as for you, do not be called rabbi. For only one is your teacher or father, and you are all brothers and sisters. The word rabbi means teacher or father. And do not call anyone on earth your father, for only one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called leaders, for only one is your leader, that is Christ. But the greatest of you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself or herself shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. Just a little aside, since oh, it's a lazy day and we don't have a flight to catch. A thought came into my mind that I read in Barclay's commentary that when Jesus said those words, there was a rabbi who was, he wasn't the chief rabbi, but he had raised himself to prominence and he insisted on being called rabbi. And he was, the commentary says that at the crucifixion of Jesus, it was his son, son of the rabbi, Bar Rabbas who was exchanged for Jesus. What a God we serve. When you dig into this stuff, you know, there are so many little nuances and so many wonderful um, nuggets that can really just send you off like a rocket into heavenly places. But I promise to do radical surgery. So I must go on and keep my promise. You see, while we need to watch out for and over each other and gently be our sisters or brothers keeper, holding each other accountable to God and his word alone, we must not use human dogmas to put heavy burdens on each other. But with the development of customs and practices and intermingling of cultural ways of doing things, strong expectations have taken shape in the Christian church that are not based on Christ's commands, but are from human opinions and actions. And there are some churches that insist we do them more than they insist on our following the commands of God. For example, the practice of some churches of burning leftover communion bread and pouring the juice in the ground comes from the Roman Catholic Church, which teaches that in the Eucharistic offering, bread and wine are actually changed into the very body and blood of Christ. Therefore, they must be treated as such. We do not believe in that and we do not practice that which is known as transubstantiation. I can't even pronounce it. Because to us, the emblems of bread and juice represent, they represent, they are symbols of the blood and body of Christ. So we dispose of them as we believe Jesus would, by inviting his little children to enjoy them after the service is over. Okay, take me to the hill and stone me. <laughs> to do so is considered in some quarters as an unforgivable sin based on humanity's humanly imposed traditions. And my addressing a different way of disposing of these elements may become fodder for gossip. Then, unchecked rumors are added and repeated across the internet or social media spectrum without regard for the impact of such atrocities that alienate and ostracize those who might be guided by the Holy Spirit to become part 
of our holy koinonia fellowship. That's not only a form of oppression. We must take our stand against the posting of unproved things on the public, in the public marketplace. But such unholy opinions and actions are subtly known or felt and often curtail the excitement, attendance, and active participation of those hurt and harmed by those gossips. I recently read somewhere this statement. Great minds discuss ideas. Average minds discuss events. Small minds discuss people. So if you are among those with small minds who practice subtle pressures on others to uphold human opinions and actions, cut it off. There begins the radical surgery, and there is no anesthesia. Jesus then proceeds to describe with vivid metaphors in verses 8 to 9 things every Christian must cut off from a life lived in and for him. So significant and compelling is this, he reiterated two graphic metaphors from his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 to 30. They resonate, resonate with things we 21st century Christians must cut out of our Christian experience to be fully engaged in the kingdom of God. The first is in verse 8, where Jesus said, And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. And don't just leave it where it can add itself back to you. Throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. This is obviously a figurative, not a literal command to mutilate one's body. Nowhere in scripture does Jesus or the Bible teach that physical mutilation of the body is a requirement to enter the kingdom of God or to avoid eternal hellfire. To the contrary, in Galatians 5 and Colossians 2, the Apostle Paul says such mutilations, some of which are still practiced by Christians today, have no value. So here... Jesus used a hyperbole comparison to make a point and emphasize the fact that it's better to lose a part of your body or a close member of your body to get away from the clutches of sin than to lose your whole body in sin. In using this hyperbole, Jesus also exhorts his followers to cut off everything, even something useful like a hand or foot, in order to be saved. Friends, our hand represents what we do, and our foot is a symbol of where we go or the direction of our life. Jesus said, those can be sources of temptation and causes for stumbling. So make up your mind that if or when it's necessary, you would prefer to cut them off and throw them far away and suffer the pain, the after effects of living as amputees, rather than allowing them to be used by the tempter to lead you away from God. Is that clear? Listen, Jesus said emphatically, it's better to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into the eternal fire God has prepared for those who reject him. So since this is hyperbole, 
What are some of the real specific opinions and actions we must cut off right now? Because here comes the radical surgery. Yep. One that immediately comes to mind is our propensity for criticizing ourselves and others. Criticism is, of course, a very complex phenomenon influenced by a myriad of social, psychological, cultural, and loss of lack of, or loss or lack of early childhood developmental needs and factors. The human propensity for criticizing how others and putting down oneself is deeply ingrained in our social fabric and psychological makeup. It's a behavior that spans cultures, generations, and contexts, often manifested, man, manifesting itself in various forms, from subtle judgments to outright condemnation. And it's hard to get rid of it. It is a form of internal oppression because we are afraid of experiencing criticism, but our great weakness is to conform to it to find acceptance and favor and maybe even commendation from others who make a habit of these subtle sins. Cut it off. And fill your heart with peace and contentment, knowing that Jesus didn't shed his blood so that we could be yoked under a new form of fear. For like fear, criticism causes us to imagine and obsess about what those many sets of eyes around us see when they look at us. We obsess about what their opinion is of our looks or how we walk and talk and eat and drink. What did you come to church to do? Be critical. Cut it out. Are you here because you were desperately in need of love, forgiveness, and acceptance? Yes, I am. You are in the right place. For we believe the grace place is God's community of contentment, a society of solace, a people of peace, not a brood of vipers who ramp up pressure on each other by criticism. So if you have a propensity for criticism, cut it off. For criticism often arises from feelings of insecurity, inadequacy, or a desire for validation that is not coming your way. Criticism is actually a cheap brand of anesthetic to deaden the pain of an empty life. For by highlighting the faults of others, some seek to elevate their own status or deflect attention away from their own shortcomings. So cut it off. Criticism may serve as a coping mechanism for dealing with feelings of powerlessness, frustration, or to regain a sense of control by exerting judgment over others. Cut it out. Criticism carries the major risk of causing harm if wielded indiscriminately or maliciously, particularly in the church. So for Christ's sake, cut it out. I think I should get some audience participation. So turn to your neighbor and say, let's cut it out. Cut it out. Yeah. Let's do the radical surgery and get rid of it. And now that we're on a roll, how about our proclivity for complaining? It's a pervasive aspect of our behavior, often serving as a means of expressing dissatisfaction, seeking validation, or initiating change. From trivial grievances to profound injustices, Humans have to vocalize their discontent in various forms, ranging from casual grumbling, nagging murmurings, to impassioned protests. Whether it be dissatisfaction with personal circumstances, 
societal injustices, or mundane inconveniences, humans are wired to seek solutions to problems and alleviate discomfort through complaining. The disposition for complaining also carries potential drawbacks and pitfalls because excessive or unfocused complaining can lead to perpetuating a cycle of negativity, feelings of helplessness and discontent without meaningful resolution. Furthermore, church, bride of Christ, remember that Proverbs 27, 15, 16 says, a quarrelsome or complaining woman or wife is like a constant dripping on a rainy day. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand, meaning it's impossible. We must stop the whining and the nagging and the complaining for James 3.19 warns, don't grumble against each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. Cut it off. Constant complaints without proactive efforts to address underlying issues can strain relationships and create a culture of chronic dissatisfaction. So cut it off. Additionally, the rise of digital communications and social media platforms have amplified the phenomenon of complaining, providing widespread and immediate outlets for airing grievances and unchecked rumors about others. The time has come to cut it off. Complaints without constructive dialogue or action creates imperceptible tensions that drive people from Christian fellowship. So say to your neighbor again, let's just cut it off. Since we are addressing the subtle sins that cause us to fall short of the glory of God, how about our penchant for competition? God did not put us together to compete with each other for the prayer warrior plaque of the month, the lay preacher prize of the year, the perfect wife of the year award, the best mom of the congregation badge, or the most together helpful person on the platform. He brought us together so we can love one another in the same way he loves us as we each strive to serve him. Thus Jesus also commanded his disciples in verse 9 saying, And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. He didn't say cut it out. He said rip it out, tear it out. And throw it away. Because we might pick it up again. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Since the eye is said to be the window of the soul, this means that a person's eyes reveal a lot about their inner feelings or emotions. This basically means our eyes reflect our fears or happiness and joy. They also show when jealousy turn or brown or blue eyes green. There's also a gradation here. For the eye is more important than the hand or foot. And frequent, frequently when the offense of one member has been conquered, offense proceeds from another. When we cut off the foot or hand, Guess what? The eye is right there looking to compete. But does Jesus really want his followers to tear out their eyes in order to avoid sinning? Absolutely not. He is again using the communication technique of hyperbole to communicate to his disciples the degree of seriousness with which they should deal with the sin of competition. You see, jealousy to, to to, is, is the companion of competition. 
It says, compete with each other. Envy their best friend. Envy, their best friend says, destroy each other. And that's why Jesus emphasized this warning. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than two eyes to be thrown into the fire of hell. So tear it out. Jesus doesn't want any of us to have a casual attitude to the deadly consequences of sin. Therefore, if your eye offends by pride, tear it out. Tell somebody next to you, it's time that we tear it out. And don't think that telling me that you want to be like me when you grow up means that it's a compliment. Because you don't know the hell that I've gone through to be standing here today. Would you want to go through that? Yes. There are times when I've had to tear out an eye. And there are times when I didn't and should have. And suffered and paid the consequences. Are you willing to do that? Because our church needs us to do that. Because there are godly people whom Jesus Christ has set up around this building who need to be here week after week, but they have had a bad impression of who we are. Because in the news, what they tell is not the good things that we do. But it's the bad ways we compete. So tear it out. Cut it off. Throw it away. And guess what? We can't do this on our own. We have to partner with Jesus Christ. So having decided that you want to join me in performing this radical surgery, and don't try to do it on me. Do it on you. Don't try to do it on your neighbor. Do it on you. And now that you've decided to participate in this radical surgery, and I may not have named some of the things that you need to cut off, but you know the Holy Spirit is upon you, telling you this is it. This is the day that the Lord has made for you to be free from A, B, C, D. Cut it off. Tear it up. Tear it out. And throw it far away from you. As we pray together. Jesus Christ. We can't do this by ourselves. We want to. Cut it off. We want to tear it out. We want to get rid of these things that hinder us from enjoying the abundant life you have promised. You said that we should be having that abundant life right here, right now, on earth before we get to heaven. And most of us are going to die and even get to heaven to see you and yet not experience that abundant life here on earth. So come, Jesus. Somebody cry out, Jesus, come. Come, Jesus. Come into our hearts. Come into our minds. Come into our lives now, today, while it is still today. Come, Jesus, come. Say it again. Come, Jesus, come. Say his name again. It's his his name. We should be saying Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Come, tear it out. Cut it out. We want to be free. We want to be free. We know we are saved by the blood of the Lamb. But we are not free. Come do this radical surgery. Jesus Christ. Don't let us leave here with these things. Don't let us go. 
from your presence without receiving that for which we came. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, while we're getting your mic, mic up, um, I want to say hi to our gracers and um, to invite everyone to join in the family chat. We do this after a worship service because there might be questions that you have and comments that you'd like to make. And so we pass a mic around and, uh, and we don't mind critique. We don't like criticism, but we love critique. Um, so you can do that um, during this time period. And please stay by because we have a delicious lunch that was delivered just not too long ago um, for us to enjoy. Yes. Mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Are you on now? I think so. Can oh. everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Amen. It's working. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Wasn't the sermon good, everyone? Yeah. Somebody say, cut it off. Cut it off. And throw it away. Yeah. That's the biggest takeaway uh, for me. Yeah. God would rather me be an MPP. Yeah. God Spiritually. Would, uh, yeah, spiritual. He would prefer for me to be an MPP and make it in the kingdom than for my entirety to be burned. When you were reading and you kind of ex expanded um, in Matthew 18, um, you also said, cut it off mm -hmm. and throw it away because you don't want it reattached to you. Yes. Can we talk about how dangerous it is to, you've cut something off, mm -hmm. yeah, but then you're leaving it in your vicinity, you're looking at it, you're wanting it, you're yeah. missing it. Yeah. But, yeah. In, Get, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Getting rid of sin for Christians is like dieting. Oh my God. <laughs> You know, we do it, and then before you know it, You're we realize it we're <laughs> You gained the weight back. You gained the weight back. You bought the snacks back. Yeah, 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 yeah So yeah, that's yeah. why he's emphasizing throw, throw it, it away. far away, far away, yeah. where, you know, you can't reach it at all. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the other part and that, yeah. Maybe throwing it away mm -hmm. means that, you know, there, there are some people in our lives who um, do not help us mm -hmm. to keep away from mm -hmm. the things we've thrown away. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to be um, wise enough to say to ourselves, mm -hmm. this is not functioning in the way mm -hmm. that it should. And, you know, we're not God. We know that God allowed um, Judas... He knew who Judas was. Mm -hmm. He knew how Judas came. In fact, the Bible says that he himself invited mm -hmm. Judas mm -hmm. to be one with of one the, of them. The 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he didn't cut off Judas. Mm -hmm. So we can't use that as a, as a reason to say, you know, we won't cut off this relationship or this friendship because Jesus kept Judas with him Jesus to the end. Purpose. But Jesus had a purpose mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to save Judas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That also highlights the struggle that we may even have um, cutting off those that need to be cut off. Yeah. It may not be a body part, right? Yeah. It's so easy to amputate your foot. That's right. But to amputate your maternal relationship that's not yeah. really yeah. functioning. Yeah. 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 And what if you are the one that needs to be cut off? Yeah. You know, that's mm. even more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I I, like I I think I've been cut off in in <laughs> <laughs> in a few relationships. Yeah. And some of them I deserved it. Ah. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm too opinionated, and mm. so. Nobody likes somebody who knows everything. That's true. No one likes to know it all. I know. You're a strong cup of coffee? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no cream, just the black, black. <laughs> black coffee. Got it. I represent well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like your part about criticism. Yeah. 
but you are highlighting uh, the flaw within the person doing the critique. Yes. Sometimes we're harsh critics. Mm -hmm. And you're exposing that the problem lies within us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not with who or what you think you're actually mm -hmm. trying to help be better. Yeah. That was that yeah. was hard to hear. Yeah. So you have to start by looking in on your own mm -hmm. on your own self. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me not uh, hug all the time. Are there any questions? Uh, yeah, the girls have the there's a grace, yeah. gracer, yeah. Is there a gracer? Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. From the booth, tell us. And pastor. Yes. It's Kay. It's this Jacqueline was, Kay. Hi. hi, everybody. This was powerful. Like this, was. this was powerful for me in self-examination. Mm -hmm. And the examination was so deep mm -hmm. that not just the you know, do to other people, but, but to myself, there are some things that separates us from God and he wants us to cut it out. Yes. And sometimes it's those, uh, the Bible called little foxes in holes, yeah. little, the little things that you know that I got to get rid of. And it's, it is, it is difficult to get rid of it because as you guys say, it keeps coming back. Mm -hmm. And so today, um, yes, I've called on Jesus and I've made the decision to cut it off. Yes. Amen. So Amen. thank you Amen. for the sermon. It was, it, yes. it was deep. Mm -hmm. It was deep. Yes. And I, thank you so much. Yes. I had so much difficulty deciding on a title. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> one day it was cut it off and the next day it cut was it cut out. it out. Yes. It's, it, but all of those apply. <laughs> We need to do those things, and we need to do that I was wondering what the, the title of the sermon was. <laughs> it, it's whatever you make it. Cut it off or cut it out. We got to do cut it. Cut it. Yeah, you got to yeah. cut it. Make you got to make a cut. Yeah. Uh, there is a hand. Yes, he's got the mic. It's not on. It's not, it's not on. No. Yeah, there. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. So um, thank you so much for the sermon. I was touched. Uh, and thank you for your comment right now when you're sitting there talking about cutting off relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I struggle. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if that relationship, you know, after that you're feeling like it's draining you mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and uh, it's not putting in a good place and stuff like that. However, then you f feel like he, I think, I'm, uh, you know, it, it gets where you think you are stronger one mm -hmm. and you needed to help these people and you need, you know, like, I don't know exactly the where I need to, to put the boundary and mm -hmm. say, uh, this is for my salvation, but then I feel like it, uh, I'm being selfish and I, I think I struggle with the, uh, that when to cut off the relationship for mm -hmm. my good and when to ask God to help me to help this person yes. so that I don't leave them alone. I think, I don't know, how do yeah. I? Well, I, I think w one of the reasons why it feels and sounds difficult is because it suggests that you cut them off and you throw them away and you don't have anything to do with them. But, but that's, that's not, not the so. case, mm -hmm. no. And, and I go back to Jesus and Judas. Spiritually, Jesus knew that Judas was not acting right. Neither was Mary Magdalene, you know. I mean, how many times he had to rescue her. Mm -hmm. but, but, but what happens is that you don't find Judas, well, that's not true, mm -hmm. because the, 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 we normally say, Peter, James, and John were the closest, and people forget that Judas was in, the was in that inner circle. Mm -hmm. There were four, four disciples that Jesus was absolutely close to, mm -hmm. and, and you know he kept his enemy close. close. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. That's a good lesson. But 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 the lesson that I want to get at is that we don't have to be mean in cutting off mm -hmm. a relationship. But we have to be firm. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what happens when we're not firm is that we confuse the person. 
we're, we're saying one thing, but we're doing something else. And that confusion causes us um, pressure, you know, a sense of something gone wrong. Okay. So, so, but, but, but if, you've, if you've decided that this is not a relationship that's leading you into the kingdom practices, we, sh we should say, yeah. You know, I, ha I have people that I respect that I know that they are not good for me. And I tell them, I'm sorry, but I cannot have this kind of relationship with you. But I will pray for you. I will not see you hungry. You, if you break down somewhere, you can call me. But don't, don't expect that I'm going to be sharing my life secrets and so forth. And I think it's important. And stick by it. Mm -hmm. Don't one day then say, okay, let me tell mm -hmm. you. Just do it. Yeah. I think also the struggle you're having, it's very common. Because sometimes you we're not raised in healthy environments to know what a proper boundary is. A lot of us have had boundaries violated at a very early age. And so you may be uncomfortable establishing a boundary, but it doesn't mean that it's not necessary. You can do it. Yeah. 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 And this is a place where we begin to learn mm -hmm. that it's okay. It's okay, yeah. Yeah. And it's okay the feelings that you have. Mm -hmm when you take a stand for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, good morning, doctor. Good morning. Um, before you started that wonderful message, yes. a scripture popped in my mind from the book of Jeremiah, mm -hmm. which says, I, the Lord, test the hearts. He tests the minds. And so when you said to cut it off, the equal scripture is just resist the devil He'll, he'll flee. Yes. He'll flee anywhere if his motive is impure. Mm -hmm. And so, what came into my spirit was a scripture from the, the book of Deuteronomy. If you have a problem kind of finding where that boundary is, when you talked about helping the poor around, where well, the Lord said that if there's a poor person that's fallen in decay around you, Make sure that you open your hand freely mm -hmm. because this is a test of what's in your heart, in the secret place. Mm -hmm. And since he created the secret places, there is no hiding from him. So, like you said, that you know we can perform for this person and that group and this over here. But the Lord, who tests the hearts and tests the minds, will give the reward for that deed. Mm -hmm. And this scripture, it says this slight little thing that I think a lot of people may have read but overlooked. And it says to take, be very careful. Don't let wickedness crop up in your heart. And the way the scripture puts it, it just says, it just says this. It says, take care. Lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, mm -hmm. and you say, it's the seventh year, the year of release is near, and your eye look grudgingly. Mm -hmm. So everything begins with a thought. So those thoughts, like you say, cut them off, mm -hmm. and take on the mind of Christ, and just proceed. Don't yeah. worry about what people are saying. Don't worry about what people are doing. But, but I think we have a, so many people are worried about the persecution. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be persecuted. Yeah. And, but when you cut off that desire of joining the world, persecution becomes, you count it all joy. It becomes a, it becomes a great thing almost mm -hmm. in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to just say that that was a beautiful message. Yeah. Thank and, you. Uh, I want to just thank you. You did very well. Thank and, you. Uh, uh, so what God grade would you give me then? <laughs> I'll give you an A. Uh, <laughs> no, that was okay. facetious. <laughs> okay, thank you. But I accept the A. Yeah. Well, you know, 
I, th I think one of the issues is that churches are good at teaching scripture, but not teaching life applications mm. alongside scripture. So we can say, cut it off, and say, say it to your neighbor, let's cut it off. But what's How? the process? Mm -hmm. How? And what am I going to feel like when I do? Mm -hmm. And how do I deal with well, how I feel when I do, which is why most people go back. They really throw it away, but they go back because the feelings are so uncomfortable that it's better to be back in a, in a situation that's, that's awkward than to be personally uncomfortable. So I think... Um, we do a Wednesday night, uh, here's a plug. Um, mm -hmm. We do a Wednesday night program. You can get it on Zoom. Join us on Zoom. It's on Zoom only. Um, called The Painted World, Portraits of Illusion and Reality, where we talk about how early childhood developmental needs that were not met affect how we are today as adults. And, and it's very biblically based. Mm -hmm. And we talk about, right now we're, we've finished the basic psychological part and we are now looking at the biblical part uh, using words like awareness, awakening, attachments, these, these words that haunt us and we don't even know they exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. And the process. Yeah. Uh, no one talks about the grieving process. Yes. The yes. The mourning after yeah. you've cut something off. Yeah. No one wants to yeah. be vulnerable. Yeah. In our, you know, our church, yeah. it's always, our faces are like a flint, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. It's the best foot, the yeah. best. You yeah. can't be a crying yeah. pastor yeah. or, you know, or show that vulnerable. Yeah. But why? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then we have... Um, yeah. And, you know, that, that's, that's one of the hard things mm -hmm. for single people. That's why I talk openly about mm -hmm. my journey so that people can learn from some of my experiences and, and insights that the Lord has given me. Please go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I had a question about, um, you know... When Jesus talks about woe and, and yeah. talking about uh, cutting it off, um, in essence, how do we reconcile with those who may have grown up in a, or, or their experience or background is against authority or is against or have a problem with authority? And here we have Jesus, a very authoritative, um, obviously, figure, and Jesus himself, right? Um, embodying authority, how do we reconcile with those who may have a problem, perhaps, with Jesus being an authoritative figure saying, hey, cut it off, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you, you made the distinction, mm -hmm. and the distinction is between two words that sound alike but have different meanings. Some people grow up in authoritarian mm -hmm. situations. But Jesus is authoritative. The difference is that authoritarian requires that you do as they say, not as they do. And so it, it, it's very confusing. Authoritative says, this is the way, walk in it. This is what you're going to encounter if you go right. And this is what you'll encounter if you go left. It's your choice. Mm -hmm. You have free will. You choose. But I'm telling you because I know this is what the outcome will be. Then you make your choice. Yeah, and that's the difference. Yeah, yeah. That's why I love Jesus because, you know, he, he sets before me two ways, always, always two ways. You, you choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I wanted to piggyback off of that. That was a great, a great uh, point that you just made, and that was a great comment that he made. You know, when Christ, when they tried to bring people forward to Christ to condemn them, and he said, you know, do you want to be healed? Uh, but he also told them, 
an authoritative, made an mm -hmm. authoritative statement. He said, well, go and transgress the law no more yeah. or, or seven worse things would happen to mm -hmm. you. And, and that's where you get to go make your choice. Yes. Do you want to fall seven yeah. you know, yeah. steps down or do yeah. you want to turn around yeah. and go in the other yeah. direction? The, the problem, though, is in North America, um, most Christian churches are run by authoritarians. Mm. Yeah. Pay money or else. <laughs> the more you give, the more you get. You know, uh, there's a transactional relationship mm. between you and Christ, and I'm the in-between person collecting on his behalf. Uh, we don't do that here. We really want people to experience the abundant life. And it is so absolutely available, the abundant life, that we want every single person who shares a worship with us to leave with this sense that in Christ mm -hmm. there is hope. Yeah, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. You're full of them today, aren't you? <laughs> We're glad. When the Apostle Paul talked about to work out your salvation daily. Yeah. And then you have uh, 1 Corinthians 13 chapter, and it talks about love. I mean, there's just something about love that, it, since it covers a multitude of sin, it, there's just something about love that, that, that heals, it just heals everything. And if a person would just decrease, yeah. let him increase, yeah. it's just it's just that peace and that joy which surpasses all understanding. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like a phenomenon. It's, but, it's a beautiful thing. But the problem is, again, in America where everybody loves their cars and their potato chips <laughs> and their movies, <laughs> what is love? Mm. Well, you it's, know, it's so, pretty easy. Yeah. First Corinthians, yeah, but, chapter describes yeah, it yeah. so beautifully. Yeah, but the guy on the street that sleeps on my front door in the cold, and I come and say, "Get up and get out." What does? How does love play into that? Well, you know what, Doctor, that's a good point because sometimes at the, the soup kitchen and at the, and at the homeless shelters, you know, they're giving people physical objects mm -hmm. but the job is on the inside mm -hmm. so you can give the people uh, this and you can give mm -hmm. them that which are all inanimate yeah. objects yeah. but they're they're outside yeah the, so the so so here's the problem with that how can a person who's serving and we call them houseless because their home is here they're not homeless and how can a person who's serving the houseless, who knows in their minds that their husband just left them, or their wife just died, or something. How can they love? They're serving, but, but they have these big issues in their minds that they know when they put the spoon and the soup down, they've got to deal with them. Mm. How can they communicate love? We, we, we need to... Talk about those kinds of things. The reality of expressing love is not, I feel good. Da, 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 da. You know, well, you know the Christ. reality of expressing love is being authentic with ourselves. Christ had an excellent example when he said, pray for those who despitefully you. Don't let a person's actions change you. If, if your husband cheated on you, why are you in the corner crying like you did something wrong? And this is the transference of, of, of the spirit. You, you're falling to the flesh and you're falling out of the spirit, which causes a change in you when you, when you should stay on the spirit, continue to walk in the spirit. That person did that. That person lied on you. That person stole from you. That person talked bad on your name. You didn't commit that act, so don't give in to what they call reverse psychology, the guilty conscience, because once you fall to your feelings, like the book of Jeremiah says, the, 
the feelings are deceitful. You know, they're, they're, they're deceitfully wicked. Above all things, don't, do not trust your feelings. Look to the law because the law of the Lord is perfect. It, it's what converts the soul. And from there, you have no, there's nothing in between. All you have to do is just make a decision. I am going to let you have the last word. Amen. <laughs> and, That's why we cut uh, them off. <laughs> yeah, and, and have you pray for the lunch so we can go, because I'm sure it's hot it's ready. and ready. Yes. Let us yes. pray. Uh, Dr. Reeve, if you could go upstairs, they would appreciate your help up there. Did you go? And they sent you back down? <laughs> <laughs> Her work is okay. done. Okay, yeah. Are they ready? Do you know? Okay. All right. So we'll say you came down to tell us. <laughs> okay. All right. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the spiritual word that has left us full and running over. Father God, as we depart to go upstairs to partake in the physical food. We thank you. Please bless it. Bless the establishment that provided it. We thank you for every volunteer that's willing to serve us as they serve us in love. Oh God, may we appreciate the wonderful gift that they've bestowed. Father God, we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.